Hey guys, I'm Marty Kine. Welcome to episode four of my Back to Work webinars. Today we're going to talk about how to measure the value of a brand in under 20 minutes, free and easy for the people. So what is a brand exactly? Um, what is something like this worth? I'm not going to talk about you know this brand in particular, but brands in general. Obviously, intuitively, we think it has some kind of a value, financial value, consumer value, value in the market. We spend a lot of money advertising against a brand, but how do you actually measure it and how do you measure changes in it? First of all, I think there is a false dichotomy now made between um, brand and performance, and this has always been true. We think of a performance ad, for instance, as being something that's trying to get you to click and act right now, and then the branded ad would be something that's more about uh, immersing you in a feeling, trying to change your perceptions in the long haul. But I think that th that's really a, it's a false, I mean, I have two <laughs> really vivid examples here that seem extreme, but in fact, there's an element of branding in a performance ad that the brand's there. It's going to have some impact on how I feel about this particular advertiser or a person giving me a message and then on the brand side you know I may I may actually respond to a branded ad in a performance driven way so it's not either or there's a gradation measuring brand gets very complicated I mean this is a model that was developed by a friend of mine working at an agency just looking at all the different kind of metrics and and ways you can look at a, a brand campaign to try to tease out what's been impacted and the causal factors and uh, as you can see I mean this is really not even a complete model and it gets very complicated and the reason is that um, we're dealing with the human brain brand advertising is trying to change people's perceptions and literally reprogram their brain not in an evil way, people, in a positive way, but, um, and the brain is, is a complex mechanism. In fact, some say it's the densest, most complex thing on the planet. It tends to operate in two different ways. It's the fast and the slow, if you know that book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And um, advertising responds like that as well. You, first of all, you have to, in the advertised mind, I, I recommend this book, Eric Duplessis, it's, it's a great book around the impact of advertising on the brain and neuroscience. But uh, a, a, an ad or any kind of marketing message has to do two things. It has to break through the clutter. That's number one. So it has to be noticed. And then the second thing, and that's the, the fast part of the brain. So it has to be picked up by our sort of pre-conscious processing. And that's why loud emotions, loud colors, all that kind of screaming on the television, all that works because it gets your attention. And then after that, in order to have an impact as a brand, the message have an impact on the brand, it has to enter the learning process, which is the slower part of the brain, and that requires repetition. It has to be seen over and over again, and it has to have certain rubrics. Um, according to the book, How Brands Grow, which is another great one, his point was that you've got to have a very consistent look and feel across all of your marketing because that's what people are going to register. So that's the aspect of learning. So when you're dealing with the brain fast and slow. Now, in terms of measurement techniques, there are three common ways to measure the impact of, of brand marketing. Uh, there's the brand equity models, which I'll talk about, and that's, that's more of a financial approach. Brand equity, this would be, um, for instance, if you're trying to sell your company and you have a known brand, a consumer brand, what's, you, you kind of add up all of the value of all the assets that you have, everything you can measure, your profits, your losses, your, your equipment, your capital stock, and then uh, add all that up and what's left over would be attributable to your brand or, or your goodwill or your equity. Uh, brand health is a way of looking at people's perception, consumer perception of your brand and how that changes over time. And then brand impact is more about individual campaigns. So if you launch a, a campaign, um, has it had a positive or a negative impact on, on the business? So there are two different types of ways to, to measure brand and brand impact. And they tend to divide into um, these categories, which I'll call starting with the, the business or an inside out approach that's inside the corporation looking out, and that's the advertiser, and that, or a consumer approach. So you look at the market first and their perceptions of you. So it's inside out or outside in. And um, they can also further be divided, and I used to be a consultant, so we do these kind of you know, axes type charts all the time. But it can also think of it in terms of direct and indirect measures. And this really, this really sums up the state of the world today in terms of brand measurement. Um, the business ones, so the inside out ones, if you want to get a, a do a direct business valuation of brand, you, you has to be some kind of a financial model. So it'd be a sales lift model, baseline drivers, all these are different models that you can look up, a financial valuation, 
Um, if you want to do an indirect look at business value of a brand, it would be things like what's your relative market share or, for instance, price elasticity. When there's a recession on how long can you, for how long can you continue to charge a price premium? That's a, a, a measure of the stickiness of your brand. Then in terms of the consumer side, if you want to get direct information about brand perception from consumers, you have to ask them. That those are ongoing panels, custom, if you all are familiar with the brand trackers, um, Holland Partners, you know, they come out every month. So they show, show you a brand tracker that's based on a survey, uh, a representative survey of, of consumers. And that's a direct brand measurement, consumer facing. And then indirect ways are behavioral metrics and things like social analytics. So it's my perception on, on uh, platforms like Twitter or uh, behavioral metrics would be, look at something like brand search. You know, how often is your term being, is your brand um, name being searched for in Google? And that's an indirect method of measuring what's going on on the consumer side. The business driven methods, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, two of the best known are, there's Brand Z, there's Interbrand, which specializes, specializes in this kind of modeling. And this is an example of the Interbrand um, formula from a couple years back. And basically they, they, they have a sophisticated way of breaking down different drivers and then trying to derive the net present value of the brand. So what you end up with in this case is a financial, a, a number some kind of value that this brand, you know, Coca-Cola or whatever is worth. And it changes over time for various reasons, but it is a, it is a component. Part of it is the financial valuation um, method that I mentioned earlier. So you try to see what's the excess, what's the un unaccountable surplus in your total business value that you can't attribute to the actual business itself. And then some demand analysis and things like price elasticity and then strength analysis is, um, uh, a measure of stickiness over time. Other methods, you can build brand equity actually into a mix model. So a marketing mix model, as you know, will we'll try to, it will look at changes in sales and, and try to figure out what the drivers are. So it, it's an econometric model. It can be, you know, as complicated as you want. And there'll be different things that'll be um, uh, uh, identified as drivers. And something you can put actually brand health or brand, any brand metric in it as a potential attribute that has an impact on the outcome, which would be um, hopefully sales, short-term sales, long-term sales, and business value over time. And you can you can have brand health as, as a component or as a driver, as a subcomponent of these models. And it, it can have um, explanatory power. So essentially you can say, all right, well, our brand, the value of our brand had, you know, 10, 20% impact on the outcome here. So you can build into a mixed model. The consu on the consumer side, when you're doing these um, traditional brand trackers and so on, they focus on the funnel. I mean, they have for decades now, but the funnel is this thing, AIDA, awareness, interest, desire, action. These are the stages a consumer pre presumably goes through and they, they have a stage where they're unaware, then they're sort of aware if you prompt them, aided awareness, then they, are, uh, they have unaided awareness, so that's a good state. So they, they know who you are, even if you don't you know, prompt. And then they have an interest, desire, and then they, they become a customer. The trouble with those um, methods and that entire sort of rubric is that over time, the funnel seems less and less relevant. People don't seem to go through these neat stages as quickly any, or, or as linearly anymore. Um, they tend to, uh, th th there are sort of totally unknown brands that can advertise on, on a, um, a walled garden somewhere like, like in Facebook, totally unknown brand that I've never seen before, but it has the right look and feel and I'll make a purchase right away. So somehow I've gone right through awareness and I've skipped to purchase. So it does seem like the funnel may be less useful. Uh, it, they do work, brand, brand trackers, you know, I don't, I don't think they don't work. They, they have a lot of value, um, relatively speaking, over time, but they work with longer planning cycles. So, you know, you can look at, they're very useful if you're sitting down in September and trying to figure out your spend for the next year as a, as a total number. How much am I going to put into, you know, brand advertising on, on television, linear television? And so I can look at my brand tracker there and say, well, I'm having some trouble a certain demographic and my competitors taking over in this area or I have some issue on some of the dry, the, the sub components like I'm not as familiar or I'm not as likable or I'm not perceived to be as unique as my competitor and I can work on that I can work on that in the brand messaging 
Uh, another approach is, I put this together myself actually at an agency, <laughs> is a brand health dashboard. And that will take a hodgepodge of different things that are consumer facing metrics and kind of boil them up into an overview. How healthy, how, how, how well are we doing this month? And often this will be based on surveys, um, done sort of um, uh, copy testing surveys perhaps, or ad awareness that would be done by um, you know, GFK or, or so on. And then and, um, things like social sentiment will be put in there as well. So how positive, are, how positive is our sentiment in social networks? And then uh, a lot of it, as you can see here, is survey-based. Financial metrics are less important or less available at this kind of a cadence. And it can be directionally okay, but it's quite often difficult to find, to identify the drivers. Why are we down this month? Often we, we don't know, um, so it's maybe less helpful in that way. This is another example of a, uh, of a brand health, kind of a, a unique one done by Accenture called the Love Index, and this is for the hospitality business. And the theory here is that there are different um, adjectives or uh, attributes that consumers value in a particular vertical. So in the hospitality business, they, they value things be they're fun, relevant, engaging, social, helpful, using this example. And then you can, you can measure your brand against competitors on these dimensions and see how you're doing. And you can do it over time. And then you can also throw in some other leading consumer brands in different categories. As you can see, they have Amazon in here and Facebook and so on. So each of these method, methods, the inside out, the outside in, has pros and cons. The business, the um, inside out method, it is omnichannel, it's rigorous, it estimates ROI, so it has a kind of solidity that's appealing. The trouble with those methods, like the, um, the interbrand index and so on, is that it does ignore the consumer point of view. So you can look at that and think you have a healthy brand and yet be you know, widely loathed by a lot of people. So it, it, it doesn't incorporate something that seems like it's important. The other thing is that it, gives you, it does give you an illusion of precision. So you, you can maybe know less about your brand than you think doing a financial analysis. They are difficult and expensive as well. The consumer side, it does include the consumer voice, um, which is good, and they can be run in flight. The issue with those is that they are, um, they're, not, they're not a financial value, so you, you often don't know the ROI of a campaign. This could be a big problem. You know, I go back to, I go to the CMO, the CFO, and I say, oh, you, you ran that campaign, it cost you $200 million, <laughs> and you know, we, have, uh, we raise positive sentiment, 10%. And like, great, what does that mean? Uh, very hard to answer. The other thing is, uh, is directional, it's directional output. So it's good for comparing over time, um, but not necessarily for hard, hard metrics. So I would say um, three commandments. There's no real standardization. Match method to the use. So if you're trying to sell your company and you're trying to you know, show investors what your brand is worth, do a financial method. If you're trying to improve your product or really you know, develop a great campaign, look at consumer input um, and develop intelligent proxies. This is the most interesting thing that I found in my, in my brand research. There's a study in the Harvard Business Review, it was published there, done by some academic researchers. And they found that actually the, the best correlation that they found to the, an answer to a survey question and actual um, likeliness to purchase, so that is action in the market, was this question here, this statement here. X is the whatever product for a person like me. Do I totally disagree or do I totally agree? So for instance, you know, Ferrari is the luxury automobile for a person like me, um, whatever the brand is. And the, the key there is person like me. So do I think that someone who you know, has my values, reflects my place in the world, uh, looks like me, whatever, whatever I care about, you know, is my, is uh, in my, uh, in my neighborhood, um, you know, someone I might like to hang around with, those kind of people, uh, are they gonna be into this product? And if I totally agree with that, that's a good, a good sign that I, good, you know, peer pressure abiding person that I am will buy. Some examples here, um, we use this exit at an agency I worked at, this is a crowd, I'd be, a car I would be proud to own. So that means, you know, someone like me, would be, would be um, uh, happy to go and, and talk to some friend of mine about how I own this car. So, you know, it's in the club. And then a global airline, so this is the airline that gets me where I need to be. People like me, we have to go places, we need to go places, so. So I think a, a simple survey like that can tell you a lot more than um, some of the longer surveys. And the other thing to remember is from this book, Everybody Lies, is that you can't trust what people say on surveys. <laughs> 
you really can't. There's a lot of great examples in this. Um, he was looking at Google search data, which and people didn't know that um, it was being watched. It, and it wasn't watched at the user level, it's all anonymized. But this guy, Seth Stevens uh, Davidovitz, and he wrote this book and um, <laughs> It was fascinating. This example here, 1 billion, 1.5 billion, 500 million. It's a, it's a story that he tells about condom um, use. And essentially, he asked men how many condoms they used a year. He asked women how many condoms they used a year. <laughs> and uh, the numbers didn't match. I'll leave it to your imagination. But survey data lie. Uh, there, there are other kinds of information that you can use when you're trying to assess the value of your brand or the impact of a brand campaign, other than the ones I've mentioned. Uh, engagement metrics can be quite useful in different channels. And an engagement metric would be something like, how many likes did I get on an ad in a social channel? How many views did I get on my video? How many people came to my site and stayed? So multiply kind of time on site. All of that is, is useful. The trouble with um, metrics like that is you often don't know what caused it. So again, it's a driver analysis. Um, customer satisfaction metrics, are also widely used uh, and they, they can be very useful. Customer CSAT, customer satisfaction, sentiment, something like net promoter score, reviews, advocacy, so average stars on Yelp, that would be a customer experience, a CX or a customer satisfaction metric. And those are useful, uh, but again, it's, it's sometimes difficult to know what caused a change. And also these are very blunt instruments. So you don't know if customer satisfaction is up. Have you improved customer service? Have you simply improved the UI on your site? Um, is your product better? Is Has one of your key competitors just gone out of business so people like you more? It's difficult to tell. But again, it it's, can be a useful metric. I think the um, in summary here, what I want to leave you with is this idea that a brand, your brand spans the entire journey. So the value of your brand doesn't start and stop with a television campaign. It's, it starts uh, w w from the moment someone becomes aware of you or a group of people becomes aware of you. And then they go through a journey and they, they become you know, they involved and they know a little bit more about you. Maybe they become a customer. Then they have a complaint. They, they, they um, deal with customer service. They leave you. They go to a competitor. They come back. All of that is kind of impacting your brand. And so what that points to is that all of these models have some value. Um, they're, they're all t giving you a lens or a prism um, on the actual overall value of your brand. The, the business, the inside out models, brand value models can, can give you a financial picture, as I've said. Um, the indirect ones like marketing mix, like a, an econometric model can give you a little bit more of a sense of what's driving the outcomes. Um, customer experience metrics and engagement metrics can give you an indirect view of what your customers are thinking or in some cases a direct view if you're asking for a net promoter score, and then brand trackers and surveys in a similar way. So I think, I like to think of brand as a, as a layer of metrics. Uh, you wanna bubble up to an overall brand value and whether that's financial or other, and I would argue for other. Um, that is a, a weighted index of a bunch of different components. And those different components include um, strategic metrics, channel metrics, so how are you doing on your site, and then tactical metrics, so that would be customer experience and um, uh, brand ad perception, so media metrics. So it's basically a weighted hierarchy of metrics that come from all of the areas that I've mentioned. Now, what's the right, the right weight? What are the exact um, right metrics? Depends on your business and it depends on your um, business strategy. What are you trying to do? Uh, a, a new business that's in a niche category that's very luxury, high priced, would have a very different set of weighted drivers than you know, a, a mass kind of commodity company that's global and sells on price, um, low price. So uh, basically, Brand value is, is not a single technique, but it's a weighted uh, hierarchy of combina a combination of techniques. And I think that um, that's probably the, the most fruitful way to go about thinking about what your brand value is. And you'll end up using some components of everything that I mentioned before. And I include customer experience metrics and engagement metrics. What's next? Uh, I'm, I'm high on the, when, when the Fitbit came along, I thought, well, this would be a great way to measure the impact of brand, brand messaging because you know, you're, you're monitoring people's physical signs and maybe there's some way to anonymize that and then feed it into an algorithm and send it to a brand. That hasn't happened yet as far as I know, biometric feedback through you know, fitness devices, but it still could be done tone of voice, AI, AI can track a lot of things that we don't know it can, and eye tracking, how we're, look, how we're looking around a screen. I know that, for instance, on, um, 
uh, apps, when people scroll down, they scroll down a page, the, some of the apps are measuring how quickly people, how quickly or slowly people scroll. And if they sort of pause a little bit on an ad, that shows it's had more of an impact. But I think we'll see the, a lot more of that real-time kind of tracking going on uh, in an anonymized fashion to measure impact, probably from people who are opted in, like on panels. So recommendations, use brand health and engagement to drive uh, accountability. Establish connections between engagement and business outcomes, if you can. Um, use experience metrics to identify and prioritize experience improvements. That sort of goes without saying. If you want to improve your experience in the airport and you're in an airline, measure how people are feeling in the airport and work on that. And then build a dashboard view of brand health engagement using the integrated approach and tailor the dashboards to focus attention on the metrics. Um, if you're interested in dashboards, actually my episode number three was how to build a dashboard and it talks in this, about some of those topics. So I want to thank you very much for joining me. I'm Marty Kine. That's my cat, Jerry. It was actually here the whole time. Um, and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>